all for joining us for our fourth Art in the Libraries virtual program. Just like last time, this session is being recorded and will be documented on the library's website for public perusal. We encourage your engagement and welcome questions in the chat box publicly or privately, as well as questions using your audio and our video. At the end of the session, we'll post a survey to get your feedback, as well as the links that um, our guest refers to. Co-host Beth Torn and I are very excited to welcome Carrie Gunther Seamer as our guest today. Um, I'm just going to launch a little poll here while I'm giving her introduction. Carrie Gunther Seymour is the founder and executive director of the Women of Appalachia Project, an arts organization she created to address discrimination directed at women from the Appalachian region by providing opportunities to come together in performances, exhibitions, and publications to embrace the stereotype, show the whole woman beyond the superficial factors people use to judge her. She's the editor of Women of Appalachia Anthology Series, Women Speak, Volumes 1 through 5, and essentially Athens, Ohio. She holds a BFA in graphic design and, in, and an MA in commercial photography, is a retired instructor in the E.W. Scripps School of Journalism at Ohio University, and is poet laureate for the state of Ohio. In a time of inflated posturing and relentless self-promotion, Carrie Gunter Seymour's poems offer a refuge. A ninth generation Appalachian, her work is firmly and unapologetic apologetically attached to her home soil and is an exam examination of the long lasting effects of stereotype and false narratives surrounding native Appalachians. Her poems appear in numerous journals and publications and on her website, carriegunterseymourpoet.com. Her current collection is entitled, A Place So Deep Inside America It Can't Be Seen by Sheila Nagig Editions. A poem she wrote in support of families living in poverty in Athens County, Ohio, went viral and has been seen by over 100,000 people, resulting in thousands of dollars donated to her local food pantry. So again, at the end of this, I will share the links to her work um, in the chat box. And so I wanted to welcome Carrie and I'm gonna post the poll here. Looks like a good amount of you have heard of Woman of Appalachia. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Sally. I'm gonna have a look at this little poll here real quick. Oh my goodness, so some have, but quite a few have not. So I'm really happy to be here today to change that a little bit. Um, first of all, I wanna thank Sally and Beth for inviting me to come. And of course, I wanna thank West Virginia uh, University, Morgantown. Um, I have come here today to share a little bit about my journey and talk about what led to my sort of conceiving and creating the arts organization now known as the Women of Appalachia Project, or WOAP, as those of us involved endearingly call it, because Women of Appalachia Project is quite a mouthful. So um, WOAP encourages participation from women of diverse backgrounds and experiences and ages to come together by inviting submissions of spoken word and fine art shared in public forums and in an annual anthology. And here is our wonderful anthology. Um, this is the fifth in the series. Um, our artists share culture and experiences at arranged venues embrace issues of marginalization and stereotype, and it creates a force, unified and non-violently confrontational to show the whole woman beyond the super factor, superficial factors that people use to judge her. So in essence, uh, WOAP is all about recovery and about recovery of today's Appalachia. So in order for us to look at contemporary Appalachia, we first have to look at some history. Today and for well over a century, Appalachians have been marginalized and stereotyped. This deliberate ploy has affected multiple generations and was intended to dehumanize and belittle so that U.S. major coal companies could gain access, excuse me, gain access to Appalachia's immense coal reserves. It was at that time that Appalachians began to be characterized as barefoot, overfed, undereducated, and undergroomed, and the land was consumed by coal removal. When we Appalachians are portrayed as white trash, 
it is easier to pull off the roost that coal companies were, are, in the business to save Appalachia rather than plunder. So with the collapse of the coal industry in the late 1950s as mountaintop mining was replaced by oil and natural gas, Appalachia became a junkyard. There was no way for previously hardworking miners to return to farming as much of horticulture had been forsaken and strip mining had wrecked most of the land, leaving unemployment, lack of basic infrastructure, and no reasonable access to education. Everyone has heard the horror stories concerning the horrendous living conditions of company towns, along with the dangers and unfair work practices associated with underground mining, many of which are still going on today. Individual coal companies owned all of the buildings and businesses in company towns, controlling the income of all its families. Mining families were forced to live in these company towns and in their housing and buy from company stores with wages and prices set by the coal company, essentially creating a situation not too far from indentured servitude. In addition to the coal industry, timber and iron industries further exploited the land and we, its native people. So after years of extreme living conditions, no electricity, running water, or proper sewage, in 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson declared a war on poverty. And it was focused in Appalachia. Federal money was legislated to create social wel welfare programs, but no job or education programs which served only to protect Appalachians from starvation, but deprived us of self-respect and hope. Women more often than not fell into greater poverty and ill health due to death of partners and extremely inadequate medical care and nutrition during childbearing years. The stereotype of the backwoods, barefoot, poor white hillbilly trailer trash is a familiar visual for most Americans. Cartoons are drawn and TV and big screen comedies are produced and syndicated worldwide. It's a myth that conceals the realities of race and racism in Appalachia. So I'm gonna read a little bit today from my newest collection. It's called A Place So Deep Inside America It Can't Be Seen. Um, this is the kind of work that you will hear if you attend one of our events. And I should mention too that inside the anthology, we also feature fine art. And so you not only get poetry, song, story, essay, memoir, you also get uh, some beautiful uh, art as well. And so this piece is the anchor poem from my collection. I come from a place so deep in South America, it can't be seen. White oaks thrash, moonlight drifts the ceiling as if I'm underwater. Propane coils warms my bones. Gone are the magics and songs, all the things our grandmothers buried, piles of feathers and angel bones inscribed by all who came before. When I was 12, my cousins called me ugly, enough to make it last. Tonight, a celebrity on Oprah imagines a future where features can be removed and replaced on a whim. A moth presses wings thin as paper against my window, more beautiful than I could ever be. Ryegrass raised seedy heads beyond the bull thistle and preen. Everything alive aches for more. So over the past 50 plus years, further programs have been implemented, including those resulting in educational and training opportunities for Appalachians, though certainly not as robust as the national average. The economy of the region, once so dependent on mining, forestry, agriculture, and chemical industries has gradually become more diversified. In spite of many generations of struggle and unfair policies, Appalachia is producing bright, talented individuals who are skilled, well-educated, and very proudly tied to their Appalachian roots. I stand among those represented by these statistics, as do probably many of you, I imagine, 
I'm a first gen college student in my family. And there were so many. I see some thumbs up happening in the chat. I'm so excited to see that. Yes, we are strong. Um, so there have been many generations of women before us who have sacrificed to get us where we are. And so I'd like to share one more poem from my new collection. And this one's called Perfect Pitch. I rode middle school bound in the back seat of my aunt's station wagon, listening to her and mama sing Jolene. Trading verses, harmonizing on the chorus. I'm begging of you, please don't take my man. A few years later, it was nine to five. They were fired up and it was Dolly's doing. This was rural Ohio, the bottom lip of Northern Appalachia, right shy of Perry Como country. The women in my family worked the TS trim factory, spitting out Honda car parts, started out on the assembly line, worked their way up to paint, then detailing, then welding. The physical labor made their bodies strong, their future bright and like Dolly, they weren't taking any shit. They learned early on about strikes and picket lines, how important it was to organize and vote. Brave women in the workforce, determined to see their daughters inside college classrooms the hell out of factory row. I didn't know then that I was being raised by a feminist taking back her power. Like Dolly, my mama never would use that word, no matter how much she embodied it. She was proud to hang up her welder's helmet end of shift, pick up her paycheck, sing in the front seat of a station wagon with women she loved. So one of the first major shocks I experienced upon graduating with my shiny BFA and entering the professional world of higher education into an administrative communications design position was the extremes of unhealthy competition between women coworkers. It was so distasteful to me. So against all my fundamental ideologies, my upbringing, and still is. Appalachians have always been taught to be humble, grateful for good fortune in times of bounty. Academics revel in boasting. It's encouraged, expected, even required. I struggled with how to navigate the awkwardness and the confounding behavior. I worked hard to modify my twang, and I will tell you now, I'm working hard to get it back. Adjusted my wardrobe uh, to align with theirs. I laughed at their jokes, and I pretended not to notice. And eventually it came to me. The only way to survive was just to ignore it all. I stayed out of their way and I began to explore opportunities for gratification outside the workplace. I took up my pen. I found absolute bliss in writing poetry, although in the beginning it was very bad. And I began snapping photographs with a new digital camera. And I entered some in local art shows and found publishers for some of the poems. So when I was wrapped in art, I felt like the outside world just, world just could not reach me and it was a great feeling. So it was during this time I sort of had an insight to take it upon myself to create an arts organization specifically to address the discrimination directed at Appalachians and in particular women. So through the Women of Appalachia project I organize multiple exhibits and performances each year that currently showcase the spoken word arts and fine artists from throughout Appalachia um, so our artists come um, th from throughout Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Alabama, New York, and some out migrants from New Mexico, Florida, Massachusetts, and Indiana. And we also have some, uh, oh, those are the ones that were, have migrated out from the South uh, during the, you know, during the uh, aftermath of the coal uh, leaving and also uh, after the, uh, the Second World War. Um, so the first venue to agree to host us, uh, the Women of Appalachia Project, was Ohio University's Multicultural Center. Um, over the years, the project has expanded 
amazingly so to many venues throughout Appalachia, including uh, this year. Of course, we will come to West Virginia University, Morgantown, uh, Berea College, Kentucky, Marshall University, West Virginia, Northern Kentucky University, the Clarksburg Harrison Library, um, and the Dairy Barn Art, uh, Arts Center in Athens, Ohio. And I will say that other, uh, several other fine art galleries have participated over the years. And of course, some of these events may have to be done virtually and, and we, will, uh, we will do that uh, if that comes upon us. The mission of WOAP is in to enrich and empower Appalachian female artists. Now, isn't that just it? That's the essence of it, isn't it? Because empowerment and self-esteem, that's, that's all we need, right? Because we know how to do the rest. I also work to educate communities, including academia, and you can learn more about our project and submit spoken word and fine art right now for next year's anthology and for all of the events for next year at womenofappalachia.com. And you can do that now through October, excuse me, August 1st. And that's the deadline at 5 p.m. August 1st. And you submit everything electronically and send a form in the mail. Our Facebook page has over 35,000 friends from all over the world. The word is out, Appalachian Women Rock. The success of the organization is based on the support of every single woman who does, has, or will someday participate. We are a sisterhood. All for one, one for all. No one is any better than anyone else. We are all working toward the same goal to lift up Appalachia, to showcase it in all its glory. So when I'm asked to describe Women of Appalachia Project, I say, WOAP is a badass group of female artists who know very well that it is not enough to make loud denials. The Women of Appalachia Project with our stories and art do the best possible thing one can do with an impression. We layer it in language speak it or put it in a frame behind glass and generally hang it out there so the sun shines all over it. The results are rowdy, brilliant, and a little rough around the edges, but that's who we are and we're proud of it. WOAP achieved 501c3 nonprofit status in 2016 and legal trademark in 2018. Needless to say, this passion for the work I do, I'm gonna get a little emotional here, has changed my life. I began to blossom myself personally and it gave me the courage to go to grad school. Because of the Women of Appalachia Project, I and so many other women will always have friends, known and new that we can rely on to lift us up when we are down and cheer us on when we do well. Sisters, everyone a family that continues to grow closer together year after year. And I will tell you that many a husband, brother, cousin, friend have joined us through the years as volunteers and cheerleaders. And what I'd love to do right now is I'd um, like to ask Sally to help me allow, allow you all to see and be introduced to some of the women who have participated over the years. Okay, I'm going to play that video. Thank you, Sally.
awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I did have another little poll about the history that uh, Carrie shared with us, and I wanted to open it up to any questions in the chat box, or if you want to unmute uh, your audio or video. Um, I don't think I saw any. Oh, I was going to put the links in there, too. Here's one of the links. I'll put all the links that she mentioned in there. Does anyone have any questions? Is anybody interested in submitting? I could certainly speak to what the process is for that if you're interested or you might know someone who would be interested. That's a good idea. Go ahead, Carrie. Okay. It's really quite simple. Um, you simply email a, a, a Word document with a uh, with your uh, choices. So if you're submitting, for instance, poetry, you're allowed to submit three poems. If you're submitting uh, a short story, it's um, 1500 words. Um, same with essay, essay and memoir. And if you're doing song, you may submit three songs. Now you can't mix genres. So you have to choose one genre. So you're either gonna send poetry, story, essay, memoir, song, okay? Um, now, you simply put all three poems in one Word document, and you'll be emailing that to Women of Appalachia Project at gmail.com. Those will be received on my end. Uh, we do have a juror, too, actually, Bianca X, which is one of our wonderful Appalachian poets uh, from the Kentucky area, now living in Ohio, and Jacinda Townsend, who is an incredibly famous and wonderful novelist. Um, so those are two um, excellent jurors for this year. Um, and then all I ask is that you sign a form and we do have a co-op fee um, that uh, goes toward keeping the website going um, and other uh, peripheral um, costs that we have and thanks to the um, generosity of my publisher Sheila Nagig, uh, Haley Mitchell Hagen, um, the entry fee is only ten dollars this year because she's going to absorb a great deal of the um, cost and uh, the time in putting together our new anthology. In other words, she's volunteering her time to do the entire inside of the book. Um, which is a huge cost savings uh, to, uh, to the project. So uh, the benefit, if you are selected to participate, is that not only are you published in the book, um, but you also are invited to um, read it, the venues that have been set up for this year. And if you go to the website, womenofappalachiaproject.com, which Sally tried to show you earlier, but of course I, <laughs> I was reading at that time, um, but you can find information there about the entire project, where the venues are this year. Um, it will answer quite a few of the questions for you. And so basically you send a check and the form to my uh, address. Um, and we are 501c3. Technically you can uh, deduct that $10 at the end of the year if you have other deductions that you're making. So we would love to have you submit. Um, through the years, we started out with uh, five fine artists and four poets. Um, uh, the last year we had 59 uh, participating uh, poets, singer songwriters and storytellers and um, 56 fine artists. Um, and I think 15 ended up in the anthology as far as fine art. So you can see how we're growing. Um, and there's also mentoring because um, anyone who asks me I, if, if for some reason your work is not included, I'm happy to um, talk to you about it and see if there's some way I might help you or hook you up with someone who might be able to be beneficial uh, to, um, to growth. I also might know other places you could submit where your work might do better. Um, as we find out as Appalachian women, sometimes our work is not accepted places, um, especially up north. Uh, they have trouble sometimes understanding what we're talking about and the words that we use. And so lots of times there are other places that people's work could do better. And I'm happy to help with all of that. So it's all about mentoring and sisterhood and, and networking. And, um, and boy, when we're able to get together, we love to get together. Uh, we had a virtual event the past two weeks on Wednesday nights, consecutive Wednesday nights. And we had the best time ever 
virtually. <laughs> we really had a great time together. So it really is a sisterhood. And I think you can see why I get a little, little emotional when I talk about it, because it's really quite extraordinary. And I'd love to say it's because of all this work I did, but it's not. It's because of the women who join us. It's because of the sisterhood. It's because of the networking. That's why it's so special. That's why it's just so incredibly wonderful. So I invite you all to participate. Awesome. We do have a couple questions. Um, can we submit entirely online? Uh, yes, you could do PayPal. If you get a hold of me instead of send, mailing me a check and uh, I could do a, a pay, yeah, through PayPal. Okay. And then remind people who is eligible to su submit um, in case anyone is unsure. Yep. Thank you. That's a very good question. Anyone living in the 420 Appalachian counties, and you can find those online under the Regional Arts Commission, um, or anyone with strong ties to Appalachia. So let's just say you're not living in Appalachia, but you were born in Appalachia and you have since moved. Or let's say you've lived up north your whole life, but your grandparents live in Appalachia and you have a very good feel for what's happening here. Or a cousin, or you spent your summers here working a VISTA program. I mean, we're very flexible and open. We want everyone who wants to participate to participate. So just some sort of a tie to the Appalachian region is really the only um, requisite. And the poems do not have to be you don't have to be using the words mama and papa. You, you know, you write from your heart, you write what you know, but hopefully you're writing about the, you know, the Appalachian experience when you're doing that. And, and someone visiting, let's say you are someone coming in visiting your grandparents in the summer, that's a totally different experience perhaps than someone who's lived here their whole life. And that's okay too. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. <laughs> I have a question. Um, congrats on being named the Ohio Poet Laureate. How do you think that'll change your work or one of Appalachia or will it? Um, I don't know that it has. Honestly, it's a title, right? <laughs> I don't know that it's going to change anything, at least not about me or I don't think the Women of Appalachia Project. That's in my soul. And um, I, the only way I'm going to give up the Women of Appalachia Project, if someone else stands up and says they're willing to take it over and do it, and then I'm fine. I'm okay. I would, you know, that would be fine to pass that on to a, a perhaps a younger person who might have new energy to bring to the project. So I'll just throw that out there so that, um, so that you never know what might come from that. Um, the Ohio Poet Laureate will have duties, of course, but I am recently retired from my teaching position at Ohio University, so it's good timing. I can just kind of slip in. Um, there'll be a lot of reading opportunities, and um, my passion in that uh, project is to work with um, adults and hopefully teens um, who are in sober housing and working on recovery. So that's that's what that project will entail as far as, uh, you know, where my passion lies there. Awesome. Does anyone else um, have any questions? I did post the links in the chat box and I can, I will email them out as well. Um, yeah, this has been a great presentation. I love seeing all the thumbs up and the clapping and the comments in the, in the chat box. Um, and yeah. Beth just posted the survey in the chat box as well, if you have a few minutes to take that. And um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Carrie. This has been really awesome and inspiring. And um, our next Art in the Library's virtual program will be July 17th. It's going to be a round robin crafting session. So I um, hope you join us there. And for Carrie's future readings as well, stay updated on her Facebook and on the Women of Appalachia website. Anything else, Carrie, that you want to add? I I am just want to thank you again for having me, and especially for all of you who came today. I really appreciate that you're taking your time, your lunch time, to visit with us. And um, when we get back on the road again, I hope to see you sitting in our audiences. And look for posts on social media if we do go virtual. Um, and Sally will probably make everyone there aware um, of our Morgan, uh, Morgantown reading if we go virtual. And we'd love to have you join us on Zoom for that as well. And you will not be disappointed, I promise you. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon.